Let's continue our unit on imperialism. I can criticize or defend U.S. imperialism. I can predict the effect of the U.S. building the Panama Canal and then define big stick diplomacy or you can call it gunboat diplomacy. As always, this is based on the AP U.S. history curriculum. Imperialism, stronger nation takes over weaker nation. Simple definition. Simple definitions are okay. If you can put a social studies definition or even a science definition into five of your own words, and guess what? You're more than likely going to be able to understand it and use that word as opposed to a really long definition that you really don't know what it means. Why does imperialism happen? Because the bigger nation wants to steal the resources, oil, coal, gold, rare earth metals, steal them from that nation, the weak nation, to make the stronger nation stronger. And also to open up markets, because we can sell goods to America and we do fine. But if we can also sell goods from to America and to China, then we can double the amount of goods that we sell. That means we double the amount of goods that we make. That means we double the amount of workers. That means double the amount of workers that are spending money in America. And if Americans spend more money, then we make more stuff. And we get really, really rich by taking over other countries or exploiting other countries. That's why imperialism happened and kind of still happens. Perfect, let's give an example. England sells shoes to China, the money goes to England. France sells the shoes to China. The money goes out. The money goes out. The money goes out. This is great for Russia because it means more money in Russia. That means more spending in Russia. Also, if Russia is making more shoes, Russia is making shoes for Russians. Russia is also making shoes for China. That means twice as many shoes. That means twice as many factories. That means twice as many workers. That means twice as many people spending. And that's the way it is for all these countries. They're doing really well. Even Japan gets in on the game. And Japan was like China. Japan was in 1853. Remember, America imperialized China. We went in Perry with the, the gunboat saying, you're going to open your markets or we're going to kill you. And Japan's like, all right, sounds like a plan. And then Japan says, you know, we're going to do that to China because that's what helps. Now, if you look at China, you're like, oh, well, it isn't so bad for China. China's getting a bunch of shoes. Problem here is China's buying all the shoes from other countries. That means China's not making their own shoes. That means China doesn't have shoe factories. That means they don't have shoe factory employees. That means Chinese people are not making money. And if you don't make money, you starve to death. Also, with all the money going out, that means less money in China. That means less money for a Chinese military, which means even more countries are going to come in and start bullying and taking advantage of China. Then America drops and is like, well, we want a piece of this action. But America's a little late. It had already been divided into spheres of influence. Every of these European nations, they had their own little spot where they were buying and selling, mainly just selling goods. Well, America's late to the party, but it doesn't matter. America comes in and says, you know what? Those old rules are out. We're not going to follow any rule anymore. Europe's like, wait, what? No, no, no. Europe's cool. Europe says, hey, no, we're good with the spheres of influence. We got a pretty good system here that you're not a part of. Well, America says, too bad. There are no more spheres of influence. Here's how China works. Anyone can buy and sell with China, and that's that. Wait, no, what about the spheres of influence? Anyone can buy and sell anywhere we want. It's called open door policy. If we want to sell in Hangzhou, if we want to sell in... Canton, if we want to sell wherever we want, we're going to sell wherever we want. And that's the rules because Stone Cold said so. And that's the way it goes. And you can see they're all bowing down because America is the most powerful nation at that time. And so even though we're a little bit late, we get to write the rules. What about China? How does China feel? Well, obviously, we already mentioned that if China's not making goods, then their people are probably going to be impoverished. And they were. And the people were struggling. But they also didn't like the idea of Western influence coming into China. China liked being Chinese. They liked Chinese values and Chinese beliefs. They didn't really need Western views on government and Western views on religion and Western views on how the family structure should be. They liked their way of life. They didn't want to listen to us at all. So they tried to rebel. The Society of Righteous and harmonious fists. It's a lot to say. And I'm assuming that's what this says. I don't know. Don't read Chinese. But what we're really talking about are karate experts. Yeah, pretty much. They, they were masters in calisthenics. Okay. And karate, which is cool if you're in a street fight, but we're talking about a war. We'll just call it the boxer rebellion, like fighting, because that's a lot easier to say than society of righteous and harmonious fists. The boxer rebellion puts karate experts in a war versus cannons. Let me just, you guess, who you think is going to win? Karate versus cannons. Yeah, you probably know how this is going to work out. If it's a street fight, dark alley, then yeah, I'm going to bet on the boxers. But if this is a battle, then guess what? Probably not going to go with Chinese in this one. 
And America, along with their allies, for the first time we have a multinational force, they all team up, which is kind of, this seems common today because we have the United Nations. We have uh, in modern history. It's pretty common now to have countries working together to, to fight for a common cause. But in you know, the 1800s, 1700s, that didn't really happen very often. Kind of people would ally a little bit with each other. But this is one of the first times that this happens. I mean, if you look, France, England, and uh, America, we used to be enemies. We fought wars against each other. Now we're working together to steal from China. Uh, uh, you can see the political cartoon here of everyone's fighting together to take China, but also fighting for China. Here's an example. This would be before the open door policy. This is the spheres of influence. The European nations, along with Japan, are pretty much cutting up China and stealing from it against the wishes of the Chinese. Ignore the racist images. Switch over to the other side of the earth. Let's talk about the Panama Canal. We talked yesterday or in the previous video about Captain Alfred Thayer saying, here's how you take over the world. Strong Navy, check. Uh, conquer a bunch of islands, check. We also need a shorter way around the world. Right now, if you want to go from New York to San Francisco, pre-Panama Canal, it's 1,300 miles. But if you're able to carve a little passageway here, you could cut it in half. Wow, that'd be awesome because that would really help our army or our navy get from coast to coast. We really could need that. So we find the, the narrowest position between North America and South America. It's here what we call today Panama. And if we just cut through it, we can create a man-made waterway. Boom, 5,000 miles as opposed to 1,300 miles. I mean, that's less than half. That, it's a really quick trip now all of a sudden. We just need to get control of it. So you can see here pictures of them carving out, cutting through mountains and creating this man-made waterway. And let's go, I mean, it's really interesting because we just think, oh, you're just gonna you know, cut a little hole. This thing has to go vertical. It actually goes up. And there are locks that allow the, the ship to go up and down like an elevator. It's real, I think it's fascinating to me. Maybe you're not as fascinated, but real simply, by cutting this route in half, it's a huge impact, not just for a military and strategic point, but for an economic view, because now it's a shorter distance. It's much cheaper to ship goods. You use less fuel, less worker hours. You can get there and back in, in, and you can ship more goods faster. And when you can ship them cheaper and faster, then you can lower the price on your goods. And that means it's cheaper for people to buy. It's a win-win for everybody involved. I'm going to see a couple pictures here of how the Panama Canal now works. You can see the, the almost, all right, we're going up. And there's these locks that allow the water. And as the water flows in, it pushes the ship up and you go forward. And then they get to the other side. And the same thing works. The water flows out and the, the ship sinks down with the water. This allows us to ship goods. We see here, up, see Daisy, whoop, see Daisy. And so they go up, whoop, and then they go across the lake. And then it's going to, so Panama Canal, cool. But how do we do this? Well, if we went back and looked at the Panama Canal, originally this is Colombia. There's no such thing as Panama. Panama's made up. We make it up. So this originally belonged to Colombia, and Colombia's like, oh, look, we understand it's really important, so we're just going to build it on our own. And they hired the French to come over because the French had built the Suez Canal. They figured, oh, they've done it before. Shouldn't be a problem. Well, it is a problem because everybody's dying. They can't get the canal built. They can't figure it out. What they end up finding out later on is that when you have standing still water, mosquito eggs are laid in that. So you get tons of mosquitoes. The mosquitoes are spreading malaria every single which way from Sunday, and people are dying left and right. And, you know, last time I checked, zombies can't dig canals. Eventually, America's like, look, we're just going to take over. Well, you can't take over because it's our land. We know that you want a canal. We know that the canal is cool and it's great and it's going to help the economy and it's going to help a lot of people. But here's the facts. You're in America. We're in Colombia. The canal's in Colombia. You can't just walk in here, and build the canal. Oh, come on, man. You know, it's America's going to figure this out, aren't we? So here's what happens. We got to find a way to get control of this land. We got to get control of it so that we can build the canal. So what happens is we set up a phony revolution. So we find like five or six dudes in this Columbia area that like, yeah, I don't really like Columbia all that much. So we find these five guys and they start protesting like, yeah, let's fight. And as soon as that five or six, it's actually it's more than that. But as soon as this small little outbreak happens, we immediately, America walks in, we, we immediately recognize the independence of the, what are we going to call them? Panama? We'll call them the Panama people. They're Colombians. Yeah, but these people rebelling, were, they're the Panamanians. And so we officially recognize their rights as people. So if you mess with them, then we're going to mess with you. And Colombia's, Colombia can't fight America. So Colombia just basically said, all right, whatever. I guess you're just going to steal the canal from us. 
We're not stealing the, yeah, pretty much we're going to steal it from you. So that's what we do. We set up a fake revolution. We recognize the fake revolution. We team up with them and then we create like a fake country out of nowhere. So now, hey, we can build the Panama Canal in Panama. Good job, America. Diplomacy. We're going to talk about diplomacy. That was the Panama Canal. Diplomacy. Activity or skill of managing international relationships. Relations. International. Either way, the art of dealing with people in a sensitive and effective way. We're going to talk more about diplomacy in the next couple of videos, but here we will start with gunboat diplomacy and uh, big stick diplomacy. What is diplomacy? Again, it's the activity of managing relations or the art of dealing with people in a sensitive way. So really what we're talking about is two countries working things out in you know, since we, let's, so for example, you get in an argument with your friend. Let's let's look like America and England are fighting with each other, which has happened a couple, plenty of times in American history. So there's two ways they can solve the problems through war, or they can solve the problems through diplomacy. This is the sensitive and effective way of talking things out, making compromises, negotiating, finding a way to resolve your differences without war. You can do war, or you can have diplomacy, which is managing your relationship or relations. We'll talk about gunboat diplomacy to start out. President Ted Roosevelt gives these Latin American nations, all these nations we will pretty much practice this type of diplomacy with, gives them an option. Look, do what we want, work with us, be nice. We can work together and figure things out diplomatically. We don't want to do anything bad. We don't want to hurt you. Just there's some things we need, like a canal. There's a couple of things we need you to do, like allow us to sell our crap in your country. Okay, you got to let us do it. Thank you. If not, then we're going to send in our military. That is gunboat or big stick diplomacy. You can do it the easy way or you can do it the hard way. You can see in this picture, it's basically us going in with the big stick saying, look, we're going to need you to allow us to sell our bananas in your country, but we already have bananas. We don't need your bananas. And at that point, Roosevelt pulls out a stick and says, I ask you again, we're going to need you to allow us to set up our bananas and sell our bananas in your country. Do you see this stick? Do I have a stick here? I don't have a stick. If I had a stick, I would wave a stick around saying, look, do it. You get the easy way or the hard way. That is speak softly. Well, so I should have spoke softly. Do you mind if we can sell some bananas? And then if they say, no, we've already got bananas. And then you say, well, say hello to my little friend. Now, this is terrible. We're taking advantage of these Latin American countries, but we're able to get natural resources for Americans and we're allowed to open up markets where Americans can sell their goods. It means a lot more money for Americans if you wanted to defend this type of imperialism. Criticize, defend U.S. imperialism, predict the effects. We will continue later with another video on imperialism.